Hello, everyone. This is the mind of Lilith, and thank you for joining me for a brief message about the 4B movement and misandry. A few days ago, I went on Instagram, and on my feed, I saw a video that Erica Danero posted where a black man complained that the 4B movement is misandric and will turn Western women away from men. I went to the guy's TikTok page for the original video, but he removed it more than likely because he was getting clowned. And when I searched his page content, I saw a bunch of incel, MGTOW, manosphere, high value male, red pill content reducing women to nothing more than sex. Talking about the drizzle drizzle movement, male soft life, uh, basically a bunch of commentary discussing why men need to get with virgins and Western women aren't worth relationships. Mind you, this guy looks like the type to have a preference, and we all know what a preference is. So why would a guy who believes that women are a nuisance to be tolerated have an issue with the 4B movement? The 4B movement is a feminist movement that started in South Korea around 2019. The 4B stand for no marriage with men, bihan, no child rearing, bichi san, no dating, bionne, and no sex, bisako. Essentially, some of the women in South Korea have decided to boycott men altogether because women in that country are still treated like second and third class citizens who are given the sole responsibility of traditional domestic roles like housekeeping, cooking, and child rearing while having to financially contribute to the household because the cost of living is so expensive. So, um, as to be expected, feminists in the West are starting to discuss this topic which prompted the following response from Mr. Manosphere. These women are talking about how they're not going to date men, sleep with men, procreate with men, and all these other things, right? Feminism is going to lead these women into dating each other. Now, what is misandry? The official definition is dislike of contempt for or hatred of men. Why would a movement where women are minding their business and focusing solely on themselves, their friendships, their parents, their co-workers, their families, and their peace be considered hateful towards men. What component of the 4B movement is hateful towards men? Is it the no marriage component? Absolutely not. Most black men are against marriage, hence the abysmal marriage rates over the past several decades. And Western men by and large are against marriage for two primary reasons. One, they don't want to limit their sexual access to other women. And two, they are afraid of divorce, alimony, and or child support. These men hate the idea of having to pay a woman that they're not having sex with, and to add insult to injury, they'll have less money to bait another unsuspecting victim. If alimony and child support were outlawed, the marriage rates would more than likely increase significantly because these men prefer to live in a system where they can use up a woman's body, her beauty, and her youth, and then just throw her away like an old, worn-out dress to find another princess at little to no cost to him. The less money he has to pay for an ex-wife or children, the more money he has to bait and snare, manipulate, and or entrap uh, a young princess who doesn't know that she's about to marry a frog. If divorce wasn't so financially expensive for men, then they would be less risk averse, which is ironic considering that men are the most daredevilish of the two genders. Men tend to love violence and danger more than women. They love riding motorcycles, shooting guns, getting punched in the face, breaking bones. You know, a lot of men consider it a badge of honor to get their faces bashed in or to bash another man's face in. Um, you know, you can look at how men act in men's prisons and it's pretty much a zoo. So men are not averse to risk when it comes to physical harm, but they're averse to risk when it comes to their financial resources because they need the money that they have to not just survive and eat and pay bills, but to pay for sex from women who are out of their league, okay? So meanwhile, a woman's reproductive years are limited. It is not in a woman's best interest to get married to a man who may ultimately leave her to raise children by herself. Unlike a lot of women, a lot of men do not like to raise other men's children. Some men do it, but most men have animosity towards another man's children. And so it is very dangerous for and very risky for a woman to give her body to a man without some sort of financial security that, you know, in the event of a divorce, because of his disrespect and his cheating, that she'll be able to take care of his children in a manner that is conducive to that child's overall health and well-being. So these men want the woman to take all the risk, sacrificing her youth, beauty, and her firm body to give birth to children that he doesn't even want to pay child support for in the event of a divorce. So according to men, no marriage is not misandric. They don't care about that, right? 
So what other elements of the 4B movement would be an issue? Is it the no child rearing component? Is not having children for these men considered misandric? Not really, because according to black men, even after over 30 million abortions in the black community, black men are still saying that black women are having too many children. The black female reproductive rate is lower than white women's in some parts of the country. Only 60% of black women of childbearing age have children, and most of them have fewer than three children, and that number is increasing. Again, these men consider children an occupational hazard of having sex, which is the most important thing to them. If there were no child support laws, then even more of these men would have more babies that they don't really care about. The main issue that men have with children is child support. And again, child support affects their financial ability to ensnare and trap, manipulate, and woo their next female sexual victim. If all my money is going towards child support, I have less money to go to the strip club. I have less money to solicit prostitutes. I have less money for other extracurriculars. Now let's take a look at another 4B component. No dating. Hmm. Do you think that men who complain about spending money on marriage and children want to spend money on dates? A lot of the men's sphere are complaining that women are using men to pay for expensive meals without the promise of sexual access, as if my body is worth $200 dinner. It may not be worth that much to you, but it's worth that much more to me. Now, to be fair, dating is expensive for both women and men. You know, personal grooming and hygiene costs money for women. It's expensive. Um, hair care products, nice clothes, going to the salon, good quality perfume, skincare products, nails, shoes. Women tend to want to look their best on a date because if a woman looks cheap, then she'll be treated cheaply for the most part. I remember when I was in high school and these guys were looking at a pretty woman on the train. And one of them told his friends that I can afford everything she has on. I've heard men tell their friends that I look too expensive for them. So men usually uh, treat a woman better, which is relative and subjective, but they treat a woman better when they see that she can take care of herself. They usually value a woman based on how she values herself. They're more inclined to spend money on a woman who looks like she takes care of herself. So these men have been complaining about women using them for meals, which I don't think is right either. But how many women are you going out on dates with within a month where the cost of dating is prohibitive? That is a deeper issue that is not being addressed. So for these men, the no dating element of the 4B movement is not the issue. If they had it their way, every date would be Netflix and chill, AKA sex. Are we starting to see a theme here? Like anything that makes it harder for men to gain sexual access to women is a bad thing. So what would make the 4B movement hateful towards men? They don't care about the marriage, they don't care about the kids, and they don't care about the dating. Where does that leave us? The no sex piece. No sex. That is what all of this is always about. <laughs> These men, you know, have watched their communities crumble, their children get cooked on drugs and killed, their jobs outsourced overseas, gang violence, and they didn't do a damn thing but act like it was somebody else's fault, i.e. black women and white men, or someone else's responsibility, i.e. black women and white men. They didn't start a massive movement to stop the drugs from poisoning our communities. They didn't start a massive movement to stop the violence and brutality. They didn't start a massive economic movement to revitalize our communities with schools and businesses. And no, hip hop doesn't count because hip hop does not belong to the black community. But these men are ready to set the world on fire and travel thousands of miles away for cheap sex. You know, we have men like Martel Holt or Felix Hernandez who killed his pregnant girlfriend while he was married, by the way. These men will destroy their entire legacy for sex. The late comedian Patrice O'Neill even admitted that so many so-called good men would still be tempted to have sex with a passed out hooker behind the dumpster. Apparently, men having blue balls is more abusive than forcing a woman to take care of the child that you put in her body by herself. Having blue balls is more abusive than physically assaulting and even killing women who reject you. The 4B movement is not misandric. Cash App and OnlyFans are misandric. Because before Cash App and OnlyFans, it was easier for random, derelict black men to have sexual access to random, derelict women. Over the past several decades, men have been spoiled by women. We gave them sex that they didn't earn and didn't have to work for. We figured that now that we had jobs and we could take care of ourselves financially for the most part, that we could lower the traditional standards for sexual access. You know, back in the day, we had to ask ourselves, could the man that we were laying down with take care of a family? Could he build a house? Did he have a good stable job? Did he want to get married and have children? Or was he a drunk, an alcoholic, a thug, or a woman beater? Side note, 
A few days ago, I just realized that the reason why home prices are so expensive is because men don't know how to build their own homes anymore. Back in my grandparents' and great-grandparents' generations, you could not get a loan from a bank to build a home. You had to have the skills to build your own house. So the government was less inclined to charge you an arm and a leg for a mortgage because, um, you know, it would be easier for you to just build your own house as opposed to taking out some sort of exorbitant amount of money to buy a house that you could essentially build yourself. These days, a lot of these men are very pretty and they like to twerk and wear makeup and wear heels and they don't like to build anything. So the cost of home ownership is going to increase exponentially. This is why when you have people coming from Mexico or the Caribbean, they have construction skills because in their culture, again, getting a mortgage is not normal. Yes, things have changed over the past several decades, but for the most part, traditionally, if you're living in what you call a developing country, you have to build your own house before you can be considered man enough to have a wife and a family. Um, these days, men don't really do anything with their hands except shoot guns and talk on podcasts about how useless women are while the banks are charging these exorbitant prices for houses that they know that these men cannot build themselves. When you outsource labor, you are at the mercy of the market. Most Americans have essentially outsourced every aspect of domestic labor. Child rearing is now taken care of by child care services and the public school system. Food production is taken care of by these major corporate farms instead of us growing our own food. Home construction is done by these banks and these construction companies instead of the husband and the wife and the family building the home together. Like we've outsourced everything and now we wonder why everything is so expensive because you're not doing anything yourself. The entire Western market is based on outsourcing labor so they can charge exorbitant prices and that's how you create industry. That's part of the reason. But yeah, if more people knew how to build their own homes by hand, then home construction costs would decrease significantly. But instead of these black men going into these abandoned communities over the past 40 and 50 years and turning them into thriving, safe communities for their children, they went on crime sprees. They exploited the community instead of building it up. So yeah, anyway, back to my point. Women figured that since we could get jobs and take care of ourselves, um, we did not need to ask pertinent questions about the quality of the man that we were laying down with. Uh, did he have a stable, good job? Did he want to get married and have children? Did he have good character and integrity? Was he a drunk? Was he an alcoholic? Was he a thug? Was he a woman beater? All of those questions went out of the window with the feminist free sex movement, which benefited white women more than it did black women, because by and large, white culture is still socialized for marriage, family, and community building, even if the man or the woman is gay. Um, and unfortunately, Black culture is socialized to prioritize their individual needs, whatever they may be. So white women have their white girl wasted phase in college, and then they settle down to marry the investment baker or the Black athlete. And then they move to the suburbs for about 20 years until, you know, she files for divorce. Black women do not have the same leeway. Uh, there is a smaller probability that a black woman will be able to get married to a man who has the desire or the resources to give her the emotional and financial security that she needs. So a lot of black women go into superwoman mode like Andy Smith or Melody Sherry or Candy Burris and they end up in situations where they have to pull a man up by his bootstraps while still maintaining their own lives. So, you know, a few years ago, I found out that sex workers of all races intentionally avoided black men, not because of racism, but because apparently black male tricks are cheap, abusive, they waste time, they're disrespectful. They also try to steal back the money that they paid for the services and they try to gorilla pimp or convince a sex worker to leave her pimp to work for him. These horrible men feel no guilt or compunction about taking a woman's money after she sells her body. So apparently the average black male, not rappers or athletes, feel so entitled to sex, even when they're broke, that they actually get angry at the idea of not having sexual access to women that they don't care about, that they don't want to provide for, that they don't want to marry or have children with, that they don't want to date. There are even gay black men complaining about servicing black men. 
they're saying no black men either. So you have straight women saying no black men when it comes to sex workers. And you're, you're having gay men say the same thing. The gay men are saying that black men, they haggle over prices. They try to abuse you. They take advantage of you. They try to waste your time. They're bad customers for both black women and black men. It's not just a race thing where we're rejecting these black men because they're black. No, because culturally, black men feel entitled to sex even when they're broke. And they'll become angry and abusive if you don't give it to them for cheap or for free. That is why they're going to these third world countries now. So the reason why I'm saying that Cash App is misandric, and I'm being kind of sarcastic or facetious, is because the client has to send the sex worker the money before he can have sex, and he can't take it back after he's done. With OnlyFans, sex workers can sell the image of their bodies from the safety of their homes without getting exposed to diseases or potential murderers. One of the most prolific serial killers of the 20th century was a black man named Sam Little. Sam Little admitted to killing over 90 sex workers, most of whom were black women, and he did this over the span of 50 years. This man would pay these women, kill them, and more than likely steal the money that he paid them after he strangled them to death. In theory, he could literally kill five women with the same $40. If he's giving one woman $40 and then killing her and taking that money back, he can now give that the next sex worker the same $40 and do the same thing to her. So Sam Little confessed that he targeted black sex workers because no one cared about those type of women anyway. Now, I know you guys also remember the big booty white girl movement that started around 15, 20 years ago. Big booty white women were supposed to replace black women. Well, apparently among the big booty white women um, crew, the word is out about black men. We have a new generation of teenage biracial children complaining about how their white mothers hate their biracial children. The biracial children even wish they were white because in spite of being at the top of the pyramid in the black community, they're at the bottom of the pyramid in the white community, below Hispanics and Asians and other whites. Some of these same black men who are leaving white women, these big booty white women, to raise their biracial children alone are flocking to Latin America to continue the same cycle. There are numerous videos of passport bros getting into arguments with the sex workers because they don't want to pay. Now, thanks to social media hype and these men weaponizing these sex workers against black women, a lot of the women in Latin America are starting to increase their prices and charge more for sex in Colombia and Brazil and DR than these men are used to paying in the United States. So most of these men cannot move to Latin America because they need their American dollars to buy cheap sex. And unfortunately, when the dollar crashes this fall, they'll be stuck living in a foreign country with a hard penis and pesos instead of dollars. These men consider it abusive to be denied sex. They don't really care about the women at all outside of sex. One of the reasons Drake is such a successful rapper is because unlike his black male counterparts, his music romanticizes women. So his music caters to the taste and the sensibilities of women. That's why he's so rich and successful, also because of payola and other politics that happen in, music, in the music industry. Now, the fact that Drake has become the top rap artist in the world over the past decade um, is, it says a lot about the women who listen to his garbage music, but that's besides the point. The rest of these black KKK rappers spent the past three decades rapping about murder, death, violence, misogyny, drug addiction, partying, and casual sex with women. Of course, most of these rappers are secretly gay, but again, that's besides the point. They don't really care about women outside of sex. Now, before the Not All Black Men Brigade shows up, I'm not saying that all black men are hypersexual deviants. I'm saying that the manosphere was not created to fix the crime problem, the drug epidemic, poor education, unemployment, homelessness, mental illness, government corruption, or cultural exploitation by outsiders. It was a movement to shame women into having sex with broke men who will do nothing more than what they have been doing over the past 50 years. And what nothing has these men been doing over the past 50 years? Shirking their responsibilities as members of the community while sexually exploiting the vulnerable, children, sex workers, etc. If you notice, now a lot of the red pill crowd are saying that they're going Sigma. They're going to stop dating and focus on themselves and their money and becoming the best versions of themselves. Which, to be honest, kind of sounds like the cat ladies that they've been deriding. Women who, after healing from countless abusive relationships, have decided to walk away from the game and focus on their own peace of mind. Why aren't these men called cat men? 
because only women are guilted into giving her body to a man who would literally treat her like garbage as soon as she gave him an orgasm. So all in all, I'm happy that the 4B movement is picking up steam. I think that Western women and men need to take a, a pregnant pause, no pun intended, from each other because as I stated years ago, we focus too much on sex and frivolities. We need to get back to the business of being serious adults who are concerned with other important issues like the environment, the military industrial complex, education, healthcare, housing, religion, spirituality, economy. Once we stop focusing on genitalia activities so much, we can look ahead to the future and see what's coming towards us. And unfortunately, what's coming will be very uncomfortable for those of us who are not prepared, okay? Pluto in Aquarius is going to be catastrophic for the global population. Um, Pluto and Leo brought about the baby boomer generation. We had lots of babies during that time period. The opposite sign of Leo was Aquarius. So we're going to see the opposite effect happening. So how are they going to reduce the global population? By billions. You guys are seeing it in process already. People are not going to be having as many children because of economic reasons. People are not going to uh, be healthy enough to have kids. They're going to also do some, you know, alterations to the DNA to make sure that you can't have children. Many things will be happening, and I'm going to get into that some other point. Um, actually, I should get into that sooner than later because, yeah, it's kind of getting more serious now when it comes to what the agenda is for the uh, collective. But before I leave, I wanted to take a brief moment to discuss the situation with Prince Ella Clark. Not from a position of judgment or castigation or scorn or contempt, but to basically um, discuss why I have been intentional about having moments of silence in my channel. I don't post as much content as I used to um, because God was telling me that if you keep talking, you can't listen. You can't hear what I'm trying to tell you. The algorithm is very seductive and the algorithm has the ability to make you believe that you are m more than what you are or less than what you are, right? If you're not receiving any views on your channel, you may believe that your content isn't worthy of listening to, which is not true either way. The algorithm is very seductive and it's very addictive and the algorithm kind of becomes a pseudo identity that people adopt in order to garner more views for the algorithm. It's a self-sustaining mechanism. So the algorithm is not really concerned about the veracity of your content. It's not concerned about um, integrity. It's not it's concerned about honesty. It's just concerned about whether or not you're getting views and likes and subscriptions. And sometimes content creators who become really popular have seen this more on one on one occasion. It's not just Princella, and I'm not saying this happened to her per se, but it's very easy for the algorithm to manipulate content creators into playing into a persona. Unfortunately, when you have these types of parasocial relationships, a lot of people who watch your content or people in the audience or people who follow you, um, they project a persona onto you that is based on what they need you to be for themselves. And what the algorithm does is it merges itself with that projection. And the content creator then merges itself with the algorithm and that projection of the persona. And so now there's a risk of you sort of like becoming schizoid in a sense. You have multiple personalities. If you are not careful in this space, you have to be really intentional to maintain or preserve some level of authenticity by yourself by way of being as honest as possible, being transparent and not feeding into the, um, the fervor of the algorithm that has been cultivated by a persona that the audience needs you to be in order for them to identify with you and your message, if that makes sense. So my OG subscribers remember when I had my other channel, The Wounded Woman, Mind of Lilith, I made a comment on one of my videos. I said that as I'm reading your comments and I'm listening to your feedback in my head as I'm reading the comments, I can visualize a bunch of baby sheep waiting to be led by a shepherd. And I wasn't saying that to be derisive or... Um, disrespectful but it meant that you guys are really really receptive to the message that I was communicating which is an honor but if you're not anchored you're not grounded you can feed into your own hype you can feed into the persona that other people want you to be you know what that persona is based on the feedback that they give you about your um your content so if I say something that, that the people don't like they'll attack me 
and they'll attack my viewpoints, right? They'll attack the persona that they've cultivated because they don't really know me like that. And so it's like, if I don't say what you guys want me to say for the most part, now you don't support the channel or me because I'm not saying things that are conducive to who you need me to be for yourselves. It's a really tricky, slippery slope to navigate and only the best of the best can do it. Honestly, I'm not that good at having parasocial relationships. I think there is some value to having parasocial relationships, especially in the age of Aquarius, where everything is so 11th house, so social, so networky. So, you know, it's no longer individualized. It's very um, collectivist, okay? There is value in that. But again, if you don't know yourself and you're not anchored or grounded, there is a possibility of you merging with the persona that your audience has basically created for you that the algorithm merges with and marries to it. And then it becomes a part of the DNA of your channel. And then because you want to be successful in this space, you will merge with that algorithm and become what, what the algorithm wants you to be, in a sense, psychologically and emotionally. So now you're saying things that will feed into the hype of the algorithm for the most part. Am I saying it's always the case? Some people are really authentic in this space and they know who they are and they don't feed into that. So kudos to them. But I had to make sure that I was not feeding into the hype of the Love Marriage Huntsville, you know, viewership on my channel because a lot of them were very supportive and they still are supportive. And I'll always uh, appreciate them for that. But it came to a point where I noticed that the support was being weaponized in a sense, became sort of like a cult of personality, which I don't do well. As you guys know, I don't do the whole cult of personality worship. Um, I don't do the Bay Hive. I don't do the Rihanna stands. I don't, I just, it's so corny to me, like, because now you have group think. It's good to have aligning interests and aligning perspectives, right? But when you have group think, anybody who deviates from the cult um, or the group, they're attacked. They're called a hater. They're ostracized, right? And it really limits critical thinking. Repeating what someone else is saying does not make you a critical thinker. <laughs> repeating, repeating someone else's critical thought does not make you a critical thinker. And one of the negative things about social media is that we have people who are not really doing the work. They're not reading anything. They're not doing the scholarship. They're not studying. They're not really, uh, they're just crafting an identity or an online persona that is based on the appropriation of someone else's identity. And, you know, I think that Prince Ella's channel kind of blew up after um, Cynthia G was deplatformed. Cynthia G is a true critical thinker. Many people imitate her, they copy her ideas and so on and so forth. And they, just like with Kevin Samuels, they do that. And then it's like, you could tell the situation is not really genuine because uh, there's a certain ingredient that's missing when you hear these types of discourses online. When you hear people say that they're critical thinkers <laughs> and you listen to their critical thought, there's a piece missing, there's a component missing. I can identify that component and that's when I kind of push away and I don't pay attention to the person. I was subscribed to Princella Clark's channel a couple years ago. I forgot when I subscribed to her. Um, I only watched two of her videos in totality because I sensed that there was a lot of bias in her commentary. She's very intelligent. She knows how to craft arguments really well. But like Amanda Seals, um, she seemed like she had a chip on her shoulder about men. That wasn't just about uh, the literature she was reading. It was... It's almost like confirmation bias. I'm going to find resources that will prove my point about what I'm trying to discuss as opposed to like having differing opinions on her show. Um, but that was early on. I don't know what happened over the past couple of years on her channel. I discussed her having a conversation with Charleston White um, about marriage and so on and so forth. But I, you know, yeah, it's the manosphere, woman's fair stuff is, is played out. It's played. And even though I discuss it on my channel, I try to do it with some nuance and discuss other issues that are um, adjacent to the male-female gender war dynamic. And the algorithm doesn't like that. The algorithm likes to focus on one topic at a time, right? If your channel is known for this, they'll promote you because it fits in this niche category. And so that puts you in an ideological box that makes it difficult for you to think outside that box because not only does the algorithm want you to adhere to certain uh, content, but so does your audience. So now you're kind of trapped in a sense by other people's expectations of you and also the algorithm's expectations of you. So for me personally, I need to take a step back for many reasons, but that's one of them. 
um, many reasons dealing with my own personal stuff out going on and working on personal projects. But when it came to my channel, I kept being reminded by spirit or God or whatever that you have to be quiet sometimes to hear what God wants you to say. If you're constantly talking, then you can't listen. And for me, I listen very slowly. I digest things very slowly. I eat very slowly. Even though I'm relatively intelligent, um, because I have Saturn conjunct Mercury, I have to process information in bite sizes and I do it slowly. And if I do process it effectively, I can come up with some you know, unique insights um, based on my perspectives, my experiences, and my knowledge of the subject matter at hand. But yeah, I, you know, I don't know what's going on with Prince Ella's channel. She's really talented. It is unfortunate that the oppressed often tries to become the oppressor. The enslaved wants to be the enslaver. From what I was able to deduce from reading the comments and listening to commentary about Prince Ella Clark, Clark, apparently she was treating women um, the same way she accused men of treating women. And this is similar to the whole Love and Marriage Huntsville situation, in my opinion. Not to draw a direct parallel, but I had an issue with women being attacked by women who said that they loved women and they care about women. Like people were trying to attack Tisha's businesses, her marriage, Stormy's businesses, her marriage even, under the guise of love and support for Melly, but th that's a contradiction. If either you love black women or you don't. Um, and in support of black women, you don't have to tear down another woman to support another black woman. Yes, we can identify that there were some challenges in Melody and Tisha's relationship, but to try to interfere in her personal life and to try to destroy her marriage or to try to destroy her businesses, sitting with Stormy, it's a contradiction. You cannot say that you used to love and support women while trying to, to destroy black businesses and black families under the guise of supporting somebody else. That kind of dissonance is one of the reasons why it's dangerous to have group think because even with the most recent episode of Love Marriage Huntsville with Kiki and Melody, it was revealed that Kiki, you know, betrayed Melody and she did so for selfish reasons because she felt slighted in some kind of way. And in my last video that I did of Love Marriage Huntsville for the last season, I basically said that Kiki was wrong for attacking Tisha and many people in the audience vehemently disagreed with me because they did not like Tisha because she was at odds with Melody at the time. So whatever Kiki did was justified. And now that situation has backfired, right? I stated that Melody needs to get away from Kiki because Kiki looks like a hater. For you to attack your cousin who's trying to ignore you, that's a problem. So even if I have an issue with Tisha per se, I still respect her as a woman, a mother, and a business owner. Same thing with Melody. We don't need to attack or destroy someone else's home and their family in support of someone else. That's not a good thing. We don't need to weaponize our support. You can still support Melody by buying her merchandise and supporting her music and so on and so forth. But to try to tear down another black family and another black woman or other black women, that's not the way to go. I don't like that personally. So I had to pull back for that reason also. Final note, another reason I had to pull back from my channel and I'm, you know, I'm trying to work my way back up to posting more often is because the nature of social media is to borrow information, which is fine. We all do it. We all borrow information from content creators. Um, we all reference conference creators who curate information for us. That is not a bad thing. That's the nature of social media. I personally had an issue with the content that I was presenting being used as a weapon of mass destruction. I don't like that personally. I felt like even though it was a small channel, I would I had an influence in the space that made it easier for some people to take the points that I was making to justify destroying someone else's life um, or trying to destroy someone else's life. I've said this more than once, even though Martel is not my favorite person at all, I, I don't want him off the show, not because I think he deserves to be on the show, but because I am worried about how that will affect Melody and the children. I wasn't down for the whole protest against Miss Wanda being pulled off the show because again, this is her family money. Um, I didn't want her to, to degrade herself for the show. I felt like it was going to get to that point where her family was going to come on a show and look like a whole fool for the sake of money. I don't want that either, but it's not up to me, to be honest. I'm irrelevant. Seriously, I'm really irrelevant to the show and I'm irrelevant to this space in general. But yeah, I didn't like the idea or the feeling that my content was being used as a weapon to hurt people indiscriminately without any consideration for the thought processes that went into my commentary. I'm not just attacking just for sheer enjoyment. I don't enjoy doing it. It's actually quite painful for me. I'm good at it, but I don't enjoy doing it. Even though I don't know anyone specifically who was doing that because I don't really listen to other content creators, God was telling me that was happening. 
my intuition was saying, be careful what you're putting out there because it's being used in ways that you're not wanting it to be used. So I had to kind of fall back on that as well. But yeah, um, the best of luck to Princella. I hope that she can bounce back and learn from this experience. I believe she's Sagittarius and Saturn is squaring her sun sign. So this is going to have an impact on her ego, definitely. Um, and she has to kind of reorient herself and figure out who she really is in this space outside of a persona. Um, and is she as bad as the people who she's criticizing? Which happens a lot in these spaces too. So nobody's perfect. And I'm not expecting her to be perfect either. But, you know, I'm not really surprised this happened. I think this is uh, something that all content creators should be aware of as a potential for happening. People getting too arrogant and too cocky. They start to believe the algorithm is real. They start to believe in the persona that they've created, which is like a caricature in a sense. A lot of people on social media are caricatures because the algorithm wants a caricature. They want you to fit into a specific mold for the sake of the metrics and data collecting. So now you can organize content based on data clusters. That's how data analytics is utilized to generate uh, recommended video playlists. If you only discuss one topic and you discuss it in a certain way, the algorithm knows who to point you to. The people who watch Princella Clark more than likely watch Cynthia G. The people who watch Cynthia G more than likely watch a She-Ra 7 Goddess. The people who watch She-Ra 7 Goddess more than likely watch Chloe. Like the algorithm is not really concerned about the full and authentic identity expression of these content creators. All it cares about are the talking points in the channel. What category is this? Self-care, self-help, red pill, pink pill, blue pill, black pill, the menosphere. All these are buzzwords and catchphrases that are used by the algorithm to cultivate a persona that aligns with what the audience wants to hear and what they need you to be, essentially. And again, you have to make sure that you don't become a caricature persona who's just marketing an idea or a product that more than likely you didn't even come up with. People just flock into you to hear what they want to hear. Confirmation bias, for the most part, because they're all repeating the same thing. And that's how the algorithm works, okay? All right, guys, I'm gonna leave it there. I look forward to your feedback. Again, thank you all for your continued support. Hopefully I didn't come off too pedantic or condescending um, in my commentary. Again, I'm not judging or criticizing any content creators in particular. I really don't have any in mind besides the ones that I was discussing in this commentary. Um, and they have great content on their channels, by the way. So that's not it. The issue isn't necessarily the content creator. The issue is the way that the algorithm is set up, essentially, okay? One more thing, if you are still a member of the Stargazer tier, I will resume posting my astrological analyses this week. The first analysis we posted on Thursday for Nicole Brown Simpson, and the second analysis we posted on Saturday for Richard Stockton III, the guy who died in the Titanic, Titanic submarine crash last year, okay? I'm also in the final stages of editing my first official book release. Um, I'm hoping to have it published by the end of this month, but I am a perfectionist when it comes to my writing. And that process usually takes a little bit longer to complete, to be honest. Um, I'm going to have print versions of the book available first, and I'll probably end up selling it through Amazon. We'll see. But anyway, um, I'll keep you guys posted as to the progress of this first book that I'm writing. I have been receiving requests to write a book for a couple of years now, and God is telling me that this needs to be done. I have to begin my career as a professional writer because the clock is essentially ticking. Certain things need to be put out there before it is too late. All right, guys, again, I'm leaving it there. I'm going to be posting my Love of Match Hunts Phil review tomorrow. Or I'll do it on Wednesdays um, going forward. And again, I look forward to reading your feedback. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll speak to you soon.